Um, so welcome everybody to uh, the Roadside Series here in District 5. I am Claudia Calzaretta, <clears throat> the District 5 Florida Scenic Highway Coordinator. It's so wonderful to have you with us. So these roadside chats were developed during the pandemic um, as a way to connect the byway community, uh, come closer together since we weren't seeing each other face to face. And these monthly chats touch upon topics and issues uh, that are pertinent and important to the byway community. Um, I do want to stress that the series is not just for the byway community, though. Uh, when you get one of these invitations, please share them far and wide. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, that's been my philosophy forever and ever. Um, there is no charge for these, so so please send it forward. So today's guest is the esteemed Janelle Musser. Uh, Janelle is an area bear biologist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. She's going to discuss bear management program. Uh, her main job, though, is handling and working to reduce the human bear conflicts in 22 counties, which spans the central and the northern Florida regions. Uh, Janelle is a graduate of the Pennsylvania State University with the Bachelor's of Science degree. And, a, oh, and her degree is in the wildlife and fishery sciences. Uh, she's been working in black bear management and research for over six years, and not just in Florida, but also in Pennsylvania and in Virginia. So thank you for that, Janelle. You are busy. So as, as Karen Ford said earlier, uh, she's gone and muted everybody. Uh, any questions or comments, feel free to drop them into the chat box. If you don't want to do that after uh, Janelle finishes her presentation and we address the comments and questions in the chat box, we'll open it up, open it up for a uh, live discussion. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Janelle. Janelle, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, like she said, I'm gonna try to take some breaks in between kind of my sections. So I'm gonna go over just kind of some brief history, bear biology, behavior, and then move into kind of human bear conflict management. So in between there, I'll try to take a couple breaks um, for Karen to read any questions from the chat box. So if you just think of something and you want to put it in there, um, I'll take some breaks and answer them in between. Um, and so like she said, I'm Janelle Musser. I'm one of the area bear biologists with FWC. And um, here in Florida, we have the Florida black bear. So it is a subspecies of black bear. It's pretty similar to all black bears in the United States. Really the only difference is when you're looking at genetics. Um, there's not a lot you can tell from the outside or from its behavior that's much different. Um, we only have black black bears here in Florida. Um, that might sound kind of silly, but there are color phases of black bears, but we only have black black bears here in Florida, so we don't see any of those other color phases here. The one thing that we do see is we see about 30% of black bears in the state have some sort of chest blades. And all that is is some sort of white marking on their chest. It could be as small as a dot, um, or it could be much larger, like a large V or a W shape. It just varies, but we do see that a lot here in Florida. A little bit of history on black bears in Florida. Pre-European settlement, we believe there were around 11,000 bears in the state. That's kind of a big guess. That's taking a look at the maps and the habitat and what it would have looked like and determining how many bears we think that habitat could have supported. So it's really just a scientific estimate. Um, we don't really know for sure. However, once people started settling here and agriculture became a thing, bears dropped to as low as 500 in the 50s. Um, so people were killing them for predator control because they were scared of bears or even to eat them and use their hide as well. In the 70s, the bear population dropped as low as 300 so they were listed as a state threatened species. So black bears have never been listed federally by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's because while black bear populations were really low in Florida, overall the population was still doing reasonably okay. Also in 1974, they closed hunting to everywhere except Apalachicola National Forest and Baker and Columbia counties. 
Then in 1994, they closed bear hunting throughout the entire state. Um, because it was kind of confusing that you have a threatened species that you're still hunting. Um, so they decided to just completely close bear hunting. In 2010, the agency kind of created a new listed species rule. So there were new requirements. And what so that also prompted a review process to take a look at the threatened species we had in the state and endangered species and see where are those populations at? What are they doing? And so when they did that, they actually ended up removing black bears from the list. So there were some criteria that was met. We also had a bear management plan in place. So they were removed from the list. In 2015, there was a regulated limited bear hunt for the first time since 1994, and 304 bears were killed statewide in that hunt. We have not hunted since in the state of Florida. In December of 2019, FWC commissioners approved an updated bear management plan. Um, that included options for population management, but there was really no staff recommendation and there was no direction from the commissioners. So it's really just, you know, keeping our options open. It's in there, it's available, but we're not doing anything with it right now. So what does the state look like now as far as our bears? We are at just over 4,000 bears statewide. They're occupying about 49% of their historic range. And those populations are separated into seven subpopulations that are centered mainly on public lands. So in central Florida, we have the Ocala National Forest. That's our largest subpopulation. Then we have areas like Big Cypress, Apalachicola, Osceola, and Eglin Air Force Base. So those bear populations are centered on those public lands and then kind of expanding out from there. So moving into a little bit more of bear biology, um, there's no way to just tell male and female black bears apart other than anatomy. So there's no like color change differences or anything like that. The one thing is, is that males are generally larger, weighing between 250 to 450 pounds. However, our largest male bear in Florida was 760 pounds, so they can get very large. Females are a little bit smaller, like 125 to 250 pounds. A lot of times what we see with species in Florida, it's called Bergman's rule. So as you get closer to the equator, animals get smaller. And that's because it's hotter out, so they don't need to have these big bodies. Um, bears do not apply to that rule. Um, they just take advantage of the fact that they can eat a lot of food for many months out of the year. So bears in Florida still get very, very large. Um, and they get large very quickly as well. The other difference between male and female bears is that males have very, very large home ranges, about 60 square miles. Females have much smaller home ranges of only about 15 square miles. So if we take a look at what this kind of looks like in um, the Ocala subpopulation, male bears will have these larger home ranges that will kind of overlap. And then females will have smaller home ranges within those areas. Um, and so that's for a couple reasons. We use the word home range and not territory for a reason. So a home range is the area that an animal is using, but it's not really actively defending that area. So other animals will actually mark areas and defend them from other animals. Bears don't really do that. They just have a dominant structure. And so the bigger, larger bears are more dominant on the landscape. So if there's a plentiful area with a bunch of acorns and there's a 600 pound bear in there, he's gonna own that area and eat all the acorns he wants. And then after he's done, then the smaller bears can come in and the less dominant animals. So they don't wanna hang out with each other, but they're not really constantly fighting or killing each other over a certain area. And male bears wanna have as many female bears within their home range as possible. And female bears want that really high quality habitat because they're trying to raise their cubs. So they don't wanna to have to be traipsing all 60 square miles with their cubs. So they want a smaller area with lots of food. 
So black bears breed in June and July and male bears will fight during that time period. But they breed in June and July and then they go through what's called delayed implantation. So basically the sperm fertilizes the egg and it starts dividing into a bunch of little cells and then it just stops. And it stops until they go through what we call fall hyperphagia. So it's really just a big word that means they eat a lot of food. So bears go from eating about 5,000 calories a day to in the fall eating about 20,000 calories a day. And they go through this because they're still preparing for winter. So even in Florida, there's still a food shortage in winter. So they still have to get a lot of food in the fall and pack on a lot of fat. And then those female bears will lay down in a den. And at that point in time, those um, cells implant on the uterine wall and now she is pregnant. She's pregnant for about 45 to 60 days and all bear cubs are born right around February 1st, give or take a week or two. They're born inside the den. They're about the size of a Coke can at birth, so they're really small. Their eyes and ears are closed and they're completely dependent on the, on the mother and they're nursing. So bears are really amazing. While she's in that den, she's actually nursing her cubs, but she's not eating, drinking, or going to the bathroom. Um, and those cubs are growing really, really fast because her milk is really nutrient rich and really full of fat. So they're about five pounds by springtime, and that's when they're a lot more mobile and they're ready to start coming out of the den with the female bear. So they'll come out, they'll follow her around, they'll learn what to eat, how to climb a tree, everything they need to be a bear. And they'll stay with her all of that spring, summer, the next fall, and then they'll actually den up with her the next winter. And then that next late spring, early summer, she'll kick them away from her. So she sends them on her way. So typically, female bears only give birth every other year. So what do bears eat? Um, black bears are about 80% vegetarian. So they eat a lot of plants, blueberries, salt palmetto. Um, they'll even eat grass, all sorts of plant material. But they do eat some meat, but the majority of that is actually insects. So they like um, termites, ants, they'll dig up, um, you know, yellow jackets nests or wasp nests to get the larvae in there. Um, if you've ever seen the large walking sticks, they really love those. They'll eat those up. They eat a lot of insects. They do eat some animals. So whether it be like an occasional fawn that they find or if an armadillo gets hit by a car, they might scavenge that on the side of the road. Um, black bears can run about 35 miles per hour and they are still predators. They have large canine teeth, but they're kind of lazy. So most of the time they just eat plants, but they will eat some animals. And that does include penned up livestock in Florida. So if there is livestock, chickens, goats, um, sheep, ducks, those kind of things, they will eat those as well. So I mentioned acorns. Acorns are a really, really important fall food source. And one of the kind of conflicts we get with this is um, specifically in Ocala National Forest, we get um, bears foraging for acorns on the side of the highway. And that doesn't seem like it would be much of a problem, except in the past few years, we've actually had bear jams. These typically occur in out west in like national parks or something, but We've started to have it happen on 19 and 40 where people just park in the middle of the highway to view the bear that's on the side of the road. Um, the other thing that's happening is a lot of times people will think this bear is hurt or injured or sick and they end up calling our dispatch and it generates a lot of calls. And then our dispatch lines get tied up and people that may have a real emergency might not be able to get through. The third thing that we saw was happening was people were stopping to try to take selfies with these bears, to try to feed them. Um, so some negative things as well. So this year, the Forest Service actually added these um, variable messaging boards that said high bear activity, 
do not stop on highway and a fed bear is a dead bear. And it actually helped a lot. It People would still stop, but it kept them off the roadway. Um, and there weren't quite as many calls, which was good. And we didn't seem to get nearly as many reports of people feeding the bears on the side of the highway. So this is actually a picture of one of the bears. This bear, I saw her in the morning. I just happened to be driving through and um, she was still there at six o'clock at night when I came back through. So they'll spend all day out there um, eating those acorns because it's just a really easy area to pick them all up. Okay, do we have any questions, Karen, before I switch topics a little bit and move on to behavior? Yes, we just have one question. Is there crossover between bear populations in the Panhandle, Central Florida, and Everglades? Um, we do see some crossover, yes. Bears moving between corridors and stuff like that. That's something that we're always um, looking really closely at because we don't want any sort of inbreeding effects in those subpopulations, um, especially in those really small ones like over in Big Bend area. So yes, there is some. Um, bears also move between the Florida Georgia line as well quite frequently, we know that. So we get mixtures of bears coming back and forth between those populations as well. Okay, good question. Um, so moving on to bear behavior, um, we have animals that we consider nocturnal that are active at night, animals that are diurnal, most humans were active during the day. Um, bears are what we call crepuscular. And that's just a word that means they like to be active at dawn and dusk. So we kind of call that the bear hour. Um, this That changes a little bit. When bears start coming into neighborhoods and stuff, they tend to lean more nocturnal so that they can avoid people. But then that also changes in the fall when they're trying to get those 20,000 calories a day because they're having to eat so much, they will be active a lot during the daytime hours as well. So this picture is very typical black bear behavior. Black bears are naturally pretty wary and one of their first defense mechanism is to climb a tree. They have very curved claws that are very good for climbing. They can climb very high and very, very quickly. So a lot, that's one of the first things a female will teach her bear cubs is to climb the tree and then she'll follow up after them. They also climb trees so they can eat, whether there's acorns up there, fruit, or even buds on trees. So they'll climb trees a lot to eat, but also when they're scared. So if you take a closer look at this picture, there is something very tiny at the bottom of the tree that actually scared this bear, and that is a house cat. Um, so the story with this picture is that this cat actually treated the bear like three times before they took the cat inside and the bear could come down. Um, so that's their safe spot. A lot of times we respond to bears in trees and people are standing at the bottom of the tree looking up saying, I don't know why the bear won't come down. Um, and it's because you're standing there. They're not going to come down until they feel safe. So if you're there, they'll just stay up in that tree. Okay, so. Um, I have to switch screens so that I can show you the next video. So that video is also very normal bear behavior. Um, the whole thing that she's doing with her body is what we call a bluff charge. So she's running really fast, kind of throwing her arms out. And um, the reason she's doing that is to scare you. Um, but the other thing that she was doing is she's jaw popping and she's huffing. So very normal things that bears do to tell you, hey, I, I'm here, you're in my space, and I would like you to get away from me. So very normal bear behavior. It can be very scary, 
Lots of times people think it's very aggressive, but it's not. It's just a bear saying, hey, I'm here and I want you to get away. Bears can be extremely silent if they want to be. So it's really not a aggressive behavior. It's more of a defensive behavior. So when you hear those noises, you really just want to back away, maybe put your hands up, still to make yourself look a little bit bigger, and then just slowly back away. So if you're like hiking in Ocala National Forest and you're on a trail and you see a bear ahead of you, what do you do? Similar thing, you just kind of want to back away slowly, maybe say something like, hey bear, hey bear, just to let them know that you're there so you don't surprise them. And then just wait for them to either climb a tree or move along down the trail. The number one thing is you do not want to run away from a bear. And like I mentioned before, bears are still predators. So they have what we call a chase reflex. So if you think about like your dog or your cat, if you roll a tennis ball in front of them, they run after it and they pounce on it. That's a chase reflex. Anything moving that fast away from them, they should chase it and try to catch it. Bears will do the same thing. So you don't want to run. You don't want to turn your back. You just want to slowly back up and make yourself look bigger because bears react to dominance. So same thing, if for some reason you were ever attacked by a bear in Florida, you fight back with everything you have because bears react to dominance and they're kind of lazy. So once they start having to put a lot of energy into it, they'll generally back off. We have had 13 people injured by bears in Florida since the 70s. These range from moderate to very serious injuries. Um, it's important to note that all of these incidents have occurred since 2006. A lot of them involved a dog in some way, a female with young, and several of them even involved intentional interaction. So that's somebody purposely trying to interact with the bear, whether it be trying to take a picture with it or feed the bear, something like that. Something I like to recommend and we like to use as an agency, I carry bear spray while I'm hiking. I hope that I never have to use it and it just expires and I have to buy a new can. But it's not that heavy to carry, so I like to have it just in case because you never know. Bears are still a wild animal. They're still unpredictable. Um, it's pepper spray, but instead of like for a person, it comes out straight because our most vulnerable spot is our eyes, this comes out in a big cloud form because bears have very, very sensitive noses. Their sense of smell is seven times stronger than that of a bloodhound. So it doesn't permanently injure the bear, but it gives you time to get away and protect yourself. If you do decide to carry bear spray, I recommend looking up some videos, just making sure you know how to properly use it. We have one linked on our webpage but it is a good idea to carry it. Okay, are there any questions before I move on to kind of human bear conflict stuff? Uh, yes, we have, we've got a few questions in the chat here. Uh, do black bears eat fish? They will eat fish, um, but it's not something they seek out. And we don't seem to find that they are like next to the river really trying to catch fish or something. But I have heard of people like, you know, if they go fishing a lot and they throw like their fish cleaning stuff in their trash can, the bear comes and gets into it. So they certainly will eat it, but it doesn't seem to be something they seek out. OK, and uh, the next question is, are bears relocated? If so, for what reason and how far? OK, um, I'll get to that in just a minute. OK, and the, and the last one is, uh, do bears sleep in trees? Yes, bears sleep in trees quite frequently. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that every, um, you know, during the day when they go to lay down or something or take their rest that they climb a tree and sleep in it, but they will sleep in trees quite often. Um, females with cubs, they'll climb up there, they'll eat acorns and then they'll just fall asleep. That's pretty common. The other thing too is that bears will den in trees. Not so often in Florida because we have so many hurricanes and big storms that a lot of our older rotten trees that they would potentially use as a den get knocked over. But in states like Pennsylvania, Virginia, they get a lot of bears that 
If there's a tree that's still standing, but it's rotted in the center, the bear will climb up that tree, go inside of it, and den inside that rotted out tree, kind of. Any other Two questions? Seconds. That's all, thanks. Okay, all right. So in a state with over 4,000 black bears and over 21 million people, um, humans are going to influence bears and bears are going to influence people. And one of the biggest ways that that happens is through our food sources. So garbage, bird seed, pet food, our grills, um, honestly, really anything with an odor that could bring a curious bear in, um, we're going to influence each other. And so our agency gets anywhere from you know, 5,000 to over 6,000 calls a year about bears. Um, so this is a statewide graph. And if you take a look at the colors, that peachy color is what we consider our core complaints. So those are the more elevated calls. And the blue ones are what we consider non-core complaints. So things like I just saw a bear or something along those lines. So it varies from year to year, but bears take up the most, most of our calls to our agency. So what do people call about? Those non-core complaints, general interaction, just I saw a bear while I was driving, or my neighbor saw a bear, or I got a bear on my trail camera. That's about 40% of our calls. The next um, main reason that people call us is because there's a bear in the garbage. So our garbage is packed full of calories for bears and it's very easy for them to get into. You know, they just knock the can over, they just sit down and they can eat all that food. So it's very easy for them to get into. We also get a lot of calls about property damage, sick or dead bears, um, those kind of things. Bear animal encounter, a lot of times that's an interaction with a dog or someone's livestock. So if we look at our statewide bear mortality, this also varies from year to year. Um, 2015, that looked so large because of the bear hunt in 2015. So 2020, we had um, 270 roadkill bears. So we're up a little bit from the past two years, but still not the highest year. So it, it does vary from year to year. And that's um, you know, there are so many different reasons that go into that. Um, different food sources available in different places, um, weather, all sorts of things can contribute to that. So if we take a look, this is just the areas that I work the most. So I just pulled this for 2020. Um, Marion and Lake, parts of the forest, Putnam County. Um, Marion Lake both have about 50 bears each from roadkill. Um, Volusia has quite a few as well. So just to kind of give you an idea how it shakes out through some of the areas in Central Florida anyway. So feeding bears is illegal. Um, it's illegal to intentionally feed a bear. So if you're trying to hand feed a bear or you are purposely pouring out food for bears, that's illegal. However, um, what Claudia mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is also illegal. Um, if you are placing food or garbage and a bear is getting into it, that's illegal. So if you have bears in your area and every night before trash night, you're rolling out your garbage can and a bear gets into it, that's illegal. Um, the, number, the first thing that will happen if that's reported to our agency through our wildlife alert hotline and somebody gets a written notification from our officers. And it's just saying, hey, what you're doing isn't allowed. You have to come up with a way to secure your garbage or you have to take your bird feeder in at night or you can't feed the cat unlimitedly on the porch, that kind of thing. And then after that, they can get a $100 citation and then the fees continue to go up from there. So it is illegal to feed bears in Florida. So this goes back to the question that was asked, you know, when do we relocate bears and why? With those about 6,000 calls that come into our agency, the first thing we try to do is just give technical assistance over the phone and put an emphasis on personal responsibility. 
telling people to secure their attractants and telling them the best ways that we know how to secure those attractants from bears. And that's for a couple different reasons. One, because if you trap and relocate a bear, another one will just fill in the spot. Um, also, we're not always successful when we put a trap out. So bears are naturally wary. They don't really like the big metal cage we put out there. So we're not always successful. Um, another key thing is that we have a very large policy that determines you know, when we trap and what we do with that bear. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because we don't wanna take a problem bear and just put it in a new area with other people. The other thing is, is a lot of bears, about 50% will repeat the same behavior. So if they were getting into garbage in one area, you put them in a new area, they get into garbage. The other thing is, is 70% return or wander. So bears have extremely good homing instincts. And that's due to their sense of smell. So they try to get back to their original home range. And so a lot of them are successful, or if, they not, if they're not, they just end up wandering around and that can increase their likelihood of getting hit by a car or other things. Um, there's also not a lot of areas that we can take them. So even the Ocala National Forest has a lot of private inholdings, a lot of homes with inside the National Forest, um, and there's already a lot of bears there. So the question of, you know, how often do we relocate and how far away do we take them? We generally do not relocate bears out of their subpopulation. Um, and that's just because we don't really want to um, artificially just move bears between subpopulations. And also because we don't really think we should be moving them to a totally you know, new area where those people may not want that. You know, They're used to the bears they have, they might not want this new bear. So we do relocate bears. Um, generally when we do that, um, a lot of times it's because we have a bunch of bears in one area and we're just trying to ease the pressure in that area. And the other reason is, is because we will haze bears when we trap them. So try to give them a negative experience of people, maybe a negative experience from eating garbage and try to change up that behavior. But we try to not do it if we can help it. So what are some things that people can do to kind of help with these human bear conflicts? Number one thing, secure garbage until the morning of pickup. So how can we do that? Um, retrofitting trash cans is a good option. If you need an opposable thumb to open something, it generally makes it harder for bears. Not impossible, but harder for bears. Building some sort of secure caddy design to keep bears out of it. Bears are very strong, so we have specific designs on our website that we found work and hold up to bears. Um, or actually buying a bear resistant trash can. Um, we use the word bear resistant, not bear proof for a reason. Nothing is 100% bear proof, um, but these trash cans do work very well. They're tested by grizzlies out west, so they do work really well. See if this one will play. Okay. Well, bears, the thing about bear resistant trash cans or people securing their garbage is bears will learn who secures their garbage and who doesn't. Um, they will walk right past a bear resistant trash can to go to a non bear resistant trash can. They're very smart when it comes to food um, and they're very habitual. So if they keep getting into a trash can, they're going to keep coming back. But if they keep being unsuccessful, eventually they're going to stop because it's not worth their time anymore. I mentioned bird feeders. Bird feeders are full of calories. And where there's a will, there's a way. So a lot of times people will come up with creative ways to secure their bird feeders, but it doesn't always work. Um, the other thing is that um, sorry, hold on one second. There is someone at my door. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but yeah, so bird feeders packed full of calories, they will try to get into them. My number one suggestion is at a minimum to take that bird feeder in at nighttime. 
Um, if the bear's getting into it during the day, it's probably best to just not have that bird feeder out there until the bear moves along. So scare and secure. Um, it takes time for bears to learn, but they will learn that attractants are secure. Um, but they will return periodically to check. So be very vigilant. Scare that bear. Um, don't be afraid to use an air horn, a whistle, bang pots and pans, that kind of thing. Remind bears that, hey, you're not really welcome here and humans aren't the best thing to be around. Um, you only need to slip up once. Um, so just try to be really vigilant. The other thing too is if you, ha if you know people are feeding bears, whether it's intentional or unintentional, please report that to FWC. The best way to do that is to report it through our wildlife alert hotline. Um, and you can call that number 24 seven and you can be anonymous. Okay, so now I will take any other questions and comments. We've got a couple in the chat. Um, is that bear donuts picture real? Yes, it is real. <laughs> Do not do that, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> and are bear canisters required when overnight hiking in Florida? They are not required in Florida. However, I highly suggest them. And I know that at least Ocala National Forest is actually offering them to be rented through a couple private places within the forest. So there's a couple little private stores within the National Forest, and you can actually rent the bear canister for like a weekend if you're backpacking. Um, so I recommend that. I'm not sure about some of the other areas in Florida, whether they offer a similar program or not, but definitely recommend it. Thank you. Uh, this is Claudia. Uh, I was gonna type this out, but it's, it's too much. Uh, I lost connection for a little bit, so you may have addressed this. Um, so is bear hunting not going on anymore? Correct. So we okay. do not have a hunting season in Florida, um, and we have not had direction from the commissioners to have a hunting season. Okay, that's reassuring. And I will mention about the bear canisters. The other thing is that at least Ocala National Forest, they do, in addition to the state law, they have a food storage order that if you're camping or hiking in Ocala National Forest, you have to have your food secure from bears. So that doesn't necessarily require you to use the bear canister, but you have to use some sort of way to secure your food from bears. Are, are the... Is there a way to get the, the the straps or a way to retrofit an existing can? Is there a charge for that? How do you, how does someone go about retrofitting? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so there are a couple different ways to do it. Um, one of the ways that we recommend is using actually gate hasps and then like a little carabiner clip through the gate hasp. So we have lots of instructions online for that. The number one thing I'll say with that is if you do retrofit your garbage can, if you tie your garbage can upright by the handle and the bear can't get the garbage can on its side and like lay on it and do CPR on the trash can, um, the retrofit will be more successful. Um, the other option is using some sort of strapping material and like a clip. Lots of times people will try bungee cords, ratchet straps, that's not gonna work. Um, bears are really strong and they'll get those off. So we have a couple different options on our website, but if you do have questions, if something's not working or you have questions about how to do it, just give our agency a call and we can help with it. We've got a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, does the state monitor bears over time with tracking devices and annual physicals? So we do. So we have a bear management section and a bear research section. Bear research completes research projects basically by subpopulation. So they just finished up their Apalachicola study. It was a three-year study where they were collaring um, adult bears and cubs. 
and then um, and using GPS to track those bears. And then next, they'll be going down to Big Cypress to that population to do basically the same study just down there and looking at, you know, how do the bears, you know, use their habitat differently because Apalachicola is very different than Big Cypress. So we do that. Um, if we have orphaned cubs, we do complete like basically a full health assessment on those bears, um, but we don't just do like individual bears. If we do trap a bear, we collect certain data. Like we always take a tooth to age the bear. We take a hair sample for genetics. We take some body measurements. So we can look at like the overall health of bears from that as well. Are there food storage guidelines provided anywhere online? Yes, they are. Um, for Ocala National Forest, yes. Um, that is on their website. And then um, basically like our FAC, which says it's illegal to feed bears, is also on our website. Um, and then if you go to myfwc.com slash bear, um, that's kind of where all the info is about how to secure different things from bears, like how to secure a deer feeder from bears, how to secure garbage, those kind of things as well. Thank you. And we have another question. How old do bears get? Good question. Um, I, our oldest bear in Florida was I think t about 25 years old. So bears can get to be quite old in Florida. Um, we routinely get bears into their teens. Um, I think in 2019, I think we had two roadkill bears that were 18 years old. So bears do get to be quite old, um, but it, it just depends. But they can live to be quite, quite old. What a terrific presentation, Janelle. Thank you. I think for, for myself, and I think most everybody on this call has probably seen a bear in their neighborhood. <laughs> so it's a little intimidating when you first see it. But um, again, thank you, Janelle. Terrific presentation. Uh, the participants, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We had a total of 35 people call in. Um, again, if you have any interest in providing a topic for a future presentation uh, let me know send me an email give me a call uh, even better if you have a contact that would be great and for those of you that don't know uh, we have a youtube channel it's called central florida scenic byways check it out all of our presentations will be posted there this one it is being recorded and will be posted later on this afternoon uh, so Thank you very much for, for attending. Have a terrific day. Thank you. Thank you.